So in uh, 2002, Andrew Pohl took a role as a senior manager of guest analytics at Target. He had a master's degree in applied statistics and one in economics. And according to the New York Times, he's a bit of a math nerd. And I should note here that I don't know Andrew, but I suspect he's just like you and me. He works hard and tries to do the right things. Uh, shortly after he started at Target, he was approached by colleagues in the marketing department about whether he could determine whether any particular customer was pregnant using technical, technological and statistical tools. For companies like Target, that kind of technology would be a gold mine. Uh, new parents are a retailer's holy grail. They'll be buying more things and more of them than they ever have before, which makes having them as customers very good for the bottom line. Now, it's important for me to point out right now that most people in marketing aren't bad folks. They're just like me and Andrew and hopefully all of you. We work hard and try to do the right thing. But the people in marketing are just like us in at least one other respect. They occasionally make poor choices. And it probably should have been a sign to Andrew that the people who wanted to predict who was pregnant said, even if she doesn't want us to know. Uh, it turns out that the technology that Andrew developed had some unintended consequences. A year or so after it hit the network, a man walks into Target demanding to see the manager. He wanted to know why Target was sending coupons to his teenage daughter for diapers and cribs. You might have heard how the rest of the story went. Uh, the man had a talk with his daughter. It turns out Andrew's analytics tool worked really, really well. So thank you for coming out today. I appreciate your attending. This is uh, Pragmatic Ethics for Software Development uh, Professionals, and I'm Bill Horvath. I'm a principal consultant uh, for improving in our Columbus office, and I'm delighted to be here to talk to you today about the implications of the work that we're doing and what we should do about that. OK, on the count of three, I'd like you to all tell me your least favorite programming language. You ready? One, two, three. All right, very good. Thank you. There's some good research in the psychological literature that suggests that audience participation predicts audience particip participation, which means you're now much more likely to participate with questions and comments. Uh, first, I need to issue some disclaimers. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today has legal implications. Uh, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I, knew, I know a few if you need one. Uh, nothing you hear from me should be construed as legal advice, and you should consult an attorney if you need legal advice. You should consult an attorney if you need advice about whether you need legal advice, etc. Also, uh, we have some ground rules for the discussion. Make sure we don't create problems for yourselves if anyone uh, has any questions. First, uh, please don't talk about specific individuals or companies by name unless they're in the news. Uh, we don't want someone complaining that they were slandered in front of so many influential people. Uh, second, don't discuss people, companies, or circumstances related to legal cases that are ongoing. If you do, we all become discoverable, and I don't know about you, but I don't want to burn PTO on court proceedings in Columbus or anywhere else. And uh, third, be inclusive and kind. We're all here to learn and have a good time, and we can't do either if we're being knuckleheads. Okay, so the purpose of this talk is to help those of us who work for other people develop some pragmatic strategies for dealing with eth ethical quandaries at work. Uh, how many of us work for other people? Is that most of you? Cool, okay. Uh, I'm hoping you'll get three things out of this presentation. First, uh, what actions to consider if you're asked to work on something morally questionable, which we'll call a moral crisis. Uh, to how you can position yourself to be able to handle being asked. And three, if we have time, we'll delve a little bit into what malpractice is and whether it applies to software development. OK, so first, uh, let's talk about why we do the right thing. There are lots of things on which to base moral decisions. There's religious belief, of course, conscience, avoiding long nose syndrome, but we're not going to address those here today. Uh, why you do the right thing is entirely up to you. Uh, that's not really what I'm driving at here. So, oh, that does raise the question, how do we decide what the right thing to do is? 
There are a lot of strong ethical codes out there that are specific to software development uh, from IEEE, ACM, the Developers Trust Alliance, Scrum.org, et cetera. Uh, it turns out they have a few notable problems. One, they generally don't account for the power imbalance in the workplace or they ignore it altogether. They generally tell you what not to do rather than what you might do in dealing with a moral crisis. And there's research suggesting that they're ignored in practice anyway. So what happens when we're asked to do something morally questionable by our employer? Some of us might fantasize about taking the moral high ground. I refuse to work at this morally depraved company. Here's my resignation. Good day, ma'am, and good luck finding someone who will. But in reality, we often grudgingly do the work, feel the shame and humiliation of having done something awful for money, possibly becoming vulnerable to liability for our actions and stressed and dissatisfied with our jobs, all things we, I'm sure you'd agree, like to avoid. So what can we really do? In the US, we generally work under conditions of employment at will. Uh, this means that your employer does not need good cause to fire you. Uh, at, an at-will employee can be fired at any time for any reason with very few exceptions. Historically, employees at major, major corporations formed unions to fight these kinds of problems as there is strength in numbers. However, unionization is difficult, not guaranteed to be successful, and politically volatile, among other challenges. It's a viable solution, but not in the short term for someone faced with a moral crisis. The key to owning our moral destiny at work is owning the work that we do. If we own the work, we can respond respectfully and authoritatively to bad requests. So what do I mean by owning the work? To own the work, we have to be accountable. Accountability is the condition of being required or expected to justify actions or decisions. In other words, of being responsible. When we are accountable and we make a decision and take action, or actively do not take action, we must be able to explain why and how that path was taken, even if we made a poor choice. Now, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to be accountable for work that we do in service of our employer. Well, one is we can act like and be treated as the professionals that we are. We can act independently. We don't have to seek permission from others to act. We can make our own decisions about what to do and when and how to do it. We can take care of the customer in ways that we see fit so that we can deliver the best possible experience. And we can avoid a moral crisis in the first place because we're responsible for our own actions. We can't defer responsibility to someone else who told us what to do. For accountability to work, there are some preconditions that have to be met, however. We have to be honest. If we lie to ourselves, our colleagues, our superiors, or our customers, we are actively avoiding being accountable. We have to demonstrate integrity by avoiding hypocrisy at all costs. If we take, talk a good accountability game, then act in ways that avoid it, we are also actively avoiding being accountable. There must be psychological safety for us and our coworkers. We must trust one another to be candid when necessary and to be supportive, even when we make poor choices. And by the way, everyone makes poor choices, notably including myself. And our employers must agree that we are empowered to make decisions, not just when to go to the bathroom or what time to get to work, but how to get the work done in the best interests of the customer. This means deciding what we work on, when we work on it, and how we get it done. Well, it turns out that for a variety of psychological reasons that we won't get into today, these things are really hard. 
setting up the conditions that support this kind of organizational culture takes a long time if it works at all. So what are we to do? Many of us already work for employers at which we may not have a degree of accountability. How can we protect ourselves from a moral crisis? Here's what I'd recommend if you're an, at an employer where you have no accountability. First, ask to work in a team. If it's done right, a team can be as effective as a union without all the overhead and dues. Once you've established a team-based environment, create psychological safety within the team. This gives everyone on the team accountability to one another. As a bonus, and this probably isn't a coincidence, studies show that psychological safety is overwhelmingly the greatest predictor of team effectiveness. Demand empowerment and accountability at the level of the team, such that the team owns the work. And this is critical. From the rest of the organization's perspective, the team should be a unit of accountability. If something goes well, the team gets credit. If something goes poorly, the team gets the blame. Not only does this enhance the internal accountability of the team, it gives the team members a shield to protect them when they have to make dif difficult judgment calls in an organization where accountability isn't a company-wide thing. You can build your personal savings and live frugally. Uh, aside from all the other benefits, you have the freedom to walk away if you have to. You can join professional organizations like Conscious Capitalism or the Developers Trust Alliance and advertise your membership by wearing t-shirts or buttons, hanging membership certificates in your cube or whatever you like. Uh, you'll be sending a signal to the rest of the organization that ethics are important to you. And in the long run, if all else fails and you for whatever reason want to continue working for your current employer, talk to your colleagues about forming a union. It may not be the best solution, but it sure beats not having any protection at all. So all this is nice, but what if you're faced with a moral crisis right now? What should you do? Here's what I'd recommend, and this is the part where me not being a lawyer bears repeating. Uh, start with talking to management, of course, about your concerns. You talk to your boss, and your boss is not as amenable to what you're saying. You can get the team on board. Uh, it has this uh, technique actually has gets a fair amount of news coverage lately. Uh, for example, in 2018, when Google wanted to develop a new security feature called AirGap for one of their products, uh, nine of their engineers banded together signing papers saying they wouldn't do it because it would be used in military contracts and they felt morally opposed to doing work used to wage war. And sure enough, Google postponed development of the feature and reduced its scope. Regardless of whether you have a team, however, uh, remember that it might be management who came up with the unethical idea in the first place. If that's the case, you're less likely to be successful. If you come in with an attitude of this idea is unethical and I'm not doing it, uh, you'll be insulting them and not giving them a solution to the problem. It's better to say something like, this feature might be putting the company at risk even if it's not technically illegal. Could we do something else to achieve this goal that this feature is meant to accomplish? And going back to the scope thing, scope change, uh, working to change the scope of the feature is another way you might be able to address your ethical concerns while giving the company the means of reaching their desired end. If you can say, I'm not comfortable with X because X puts the privacy of our customers at risk. However, if we do Y, we can reach our goal to make bazillions of dollars and you can avoid getting subpoenas from Congress two years from now. That works to your advantage. Also consider raising interesting questions about the issue in meetings. You may be able to do so in a non-confrontational way, one that might be influential if you can get other people to nod their heads in agreement. And another tactic that might be effective depending on the circumstances is to work to delay the implementation of the feature in favor of other priorities. Uh, in the hopes that it won't be needed again later. Uh, this might work if, for example, a competitor gets into trouble for developing a similar feature and their faces get splashed all over the evening news 
with headlines like Acme's bossy McBoff face holds press conference to explain why their users' phone numbers have been hijacked and redirected to 900 numbers. If none of those tactics works, however, you're probably down to the nitty gritty of doing the work or not. So here are a few options to consider. And note that this is the part where you start taking copious daily notes about who said what to whom and when. Uh, you can refuse to take the action in question, but do the rest of your job as you normally would. This, of course, might get you fired, and if you're fired for cause, you may not be able to claim workman's compensation benefits, which is a serious consideration. Uh, you could blow the whistle, uh, either hire up the chain of management or outside of the organization to a law firm, a news medium, or a government agency. Uh, note that this has considerable risks. First, it might not work, of course. Uh, second, it might bring harm to your friends at work who, even if they're not directly retaliated against, might lose their jobs if the company goes down. And third, studies show that it rarely ends well for the whistleblower. Uh, you could look for a new job, of course. It's easier to find a new job when you have a job, so now would be the time. And your last resort may be walking out. But not only might that make it harder for you to get a new job, there may be other considerations about which you might want to consult an attorney first. So uh, finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about malpractice. Um, and again, this is not me being an attorney. This is uh, just based on my review of the literature about the topic. And. Um, a lot of us are familiar with the concept of malpractice from medicine, where uh, if a, a doctor makes a mistake in treating you, they can be held liable in a court of law. You can file a lawsuit against them for that purpose. Uh, in 2002, there's a paper by Spruill and Camel uh, in which they wrote the following, and I'm quoting here, malpractice requ requires a negligent breach of duty that is owed to an individual or organization. This duty is based on a clear standard of conduct that is held and enforced for the profession. Unfortunately, most courts apparently feel that the software industry has no generally accepted standards comparable to those in the engineering or the medical field. The case of hospital computer, excuse me, hospital computer systems versus Staten Island Hospital demonstrated this with a ruling that stated, quote, when no such higher code of ethics binds a person, such a trust is unwarranted. Hence, no duties independent of those created by contract are imposed upon them. Um, and this was, an, the name of the paper was Defective Software and the Issues of Malpractice, if you're curious about looking it up. However, this may be changing, and I don't know the degree to which this applies to an international audience, by the way, that's something I haven't had a chance to research yet. Uh, there's a paper by Toby uh, from 2018, and again, I'm quoting here. Since the dawn of the computer age, courts in the United States have almost universally rejected the theory of software malpractice, uh, declining to hold software engineers to the same professional standards as doctors, lawyers, and engineers. What is changing, however, is the speed at which software based on artificial intelligence technologies is replacing the very professionals already subject to professional liability. Society has already decided in some cases millennia ago that those tasks warrant special accountability. New to the analysis is which human is closest in line to the adverse event, excuse me, adverse event. As AI expands, the pressure for courts to go one level up the causal chain in search of human agency and prof professional accountability will mount. So the short version of this story is that sooner or later, software developers may be held to standards of practice in the not too distant future because we're writing the software that's supplementing or replacing the functionality of other professionals held to other professional standards. Uh, so this is something for us to keep an eye out for in the future. Okay, so uh, I've got a few minutes left, so let's do a 
quick exercise. Um, one of the uh, situations that I've read about in the, uh, the workplace stack exchange was a software developer who was asked by his boss to create a, uh, a new feature within the software that would allow them to remotely control their users' phones' uh, cameras without telling them that the phone camera was on. Didn't supply details as to who the company was for obvious reasons. I have no idea who it was. Um, apparently, it was a relatively mid-sized company. So let's talk about how we might apply some of the things that we talked about here. Anybody got any thoughts about, are any of you software developers, and what, what would you do under these circumstances? What's, the, what's it like for you? Anyone? Kind of hard to see. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Genius. I love it. Nobody's given me the answer yet. Good one. What else? Anyone? Anybody work in a team-based environment where the team has, is treated as unit, unit of accountability within the company? Anyone? Somebody's got to be doing that. I've been doing that. Okay, what about um, uh, some of the other things that we've talked about, like um, living frugally? Do, you, do any of you have strategies that you want to share for that kind of thing? <laughs> Don't have children, yes. I second the motion. What else? How, can you deal, how do you deal with moral crises at work? Do you push back on scope? Do you push back on timing? Can you say to your employer, hey, you know, I know that this morally questionable feature is your biggest priority right now, but this one, I've been getting a lot of calls from my friends about this one. How about if we push this up the list? Anybody try anything along those lines? Excellent. Great idea. So for those of you in the back who may not be able to hear, who's suggesting ask more questions about why the feature is being developed in the first place. What is it that we need this for? Why are we doing this thing that I'm uncomfortable with? Great idea. What else? Anyone? Excellent. Yeah, I love it. Bring the legal department in. These are great suggestions. I'm going to add these to the slides. Thank you. Bring the legal department in. Ask them to come and listen in and make sure that we're within the scope of the law. We don't want to take any unnecessary legal risks. That's an excellent idea. What if you don't have a legal department? Is there an alternative to that kind of thing? Anybody have any experience in that kind of situation if you're at a small employer that doesn't have a legal shop? Ooh, that would be neat. I'd love to Google that and see what pops up. An ethics hotline would be a fabulous idea. I have to look that one up. Okay, I'm just about out of time. Thank you all again for coming out today. I really appreciate your time and attention. Thanks.